Well, good evening. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my wife made it very clear that if she had the option of a stream, she would take it. So uh, by judging by the number of emails I got today, uh, that accounted for a lot of people. And I'm, I'm grateful that you came out because I thought, am I going to just be talking to an empty room? Um, I always give about five minutes grace, so that, but it's, it's usually less than an hour when we, we have to do our thing. Very good. So, you know, I know nobody goes. It's Tuesday night, it's 10 degrees, what do you want to do? Let's go find a First Communion meeting. Nobody does that. We hold these meetings at the behest of the bishops that have mandated that no sacrament should be administered without appropriate preparation. They don't tell you exactly what that is. And um, in the case of like First Communion reconciliation, that's mostly the parents. So, so we're happy to comply with that. We think we have a, a program that satisfies everybody pretty well. And uh, we have to coordinate a little bit, try to get ourselves on the same page first, and then uh, coordinate our, our approach to uh, preparation. So the first thing we want to do is have a little prayer. Our agenda, a prayer, a little talk about general catechesis, practical concerns, what are we going to do, uh, opportunities, returns, and see if there's any questions after that. First of all, if you came in and you sat down, you should have a folder. Do you have one? If you don't, go over and get one. Um, should have your child's name on it. And the first page of the folder, actually the second page, has a prayer. How about we'll just divide the room like this. You'll be side A over here. You'll be side B over there. So let's begin. In the name of the Father and the Son, in the Holy Spirit, amen. Side A, Lord, we witness the miracle of life and the children you have entrusted to us. Side B, help us to value and treasure this gift with all our being. together. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, fill me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from you. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come unto you that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, that was our parents' prayer at First Communion. You know, when you talk about First Communion, are you talking more about an event or a marriage or a, a relationship? Like, is it more of a wedding or more of a marriage? And you know, if you were in a position where you're preparing for matrimony, you're, you're, there's a lot goes into both. And so from our point of view, there is a lot that goes into both here. But we can't lose track of one thing over the other. Yes, we will talk about the event. In fact, I think it's, it's kind of curious, maybe funny, um, the, the ceremony that we have now, we started it under a, a 
Father Staley when he was here, Monsignor Staley now, and he actually used the word pageant. He says, I want First, first Communion to be a pageant. I want, you know, there's a kind of a performance aspect to it. I want them singing, I want them moving, I want them uh, everything. And uh, that's, well, you know Monsignor Norm, that's definitely true here too. Uh, now, you may have gone or been to a lot of First Communions, other places where they're very simple. Some people even do it, they don't do it as a group, they do it very individually, all that kind of thing. A lot of it is a reflection of, of what the pastor is looking for. Um, ours is a pretty elaborate ceremony. It not, doesn't rival a wedding, but it's got a lot of elements to it. So yes, we are preparing for an event, but more than that, we're preparing for a relationship, something that's well, hopefully going to be ongoing. In order to get ready for that, we have to take a look at catechesis. The word literally means echo. And your, the tenets of our faith are caught more than they're taught. We can tell people all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily accept them. The reality of what echoes and resonates in their life and gets integrated into all that they do is pretty much yours right now. They're a pretty strong reflection of you. Um, and when you realize that, that's both empowering and scary. Um, I've heard from several parents over the years about how Oh man, we we gotta grow up. We we can't talk like that anymore. We can't be like that anymore. We you know we we have to be serious about this now. This whole life thing. What are we what are we exemplifying to our kids? And uh, hopefully that's that's an awareness that you carry that um, what's active in you is what is being adopted by your kids. So. Maybe the first thing to take a look at is you. Do you know what you believe about communion? Do you, does your practice reveal your beliefs? Um, maybe one of the most condemning things I've ever heard. Uh, that there was a, a show, I don't even know what the show was, and they were talking about different world religions and somebody made this statement that, well, Catholics believe in the real presence of, of, of Christ in the Eucharist. And, and this guy who was Muslim, Islam, he kind of laughed and chuckled and says, no, they don't. If they really believe that, they would never miss. If they really believe that, they would act way different. And man, that'll nail your shoes to the floor. That'll cut you back a lot. You know, it's easy to, to say what we say it's another thing to really know what you believe. Like, I don't know about you, but if I had been in the crowd the day that Jesus was making that announcement where you either, you eat my body, drink my blood, or you'll have no life within you, I, I'd have been one of those people going, this just got too weird for me. I'd, I'd have been turning around and going, what are you talking about? And I like what Peter said when he turned to the disciples he just goes, are you going to leave me too? He didn't temper it. He didn't change it. He didn't say he didn't understand. He just put it on, are you going to leave me too? And I love Peter's response. He goes, huh. where will we go? And what I hear, even though he didn't exactly say it, what I hear him saying is, I don't know what you're talking about. This is really different. This is really weird. But I've come to believe you're the man. And that's where it's got to start for every one of us. Once you latch on to Jesus, then the other dominoes start to fall. And to participate in Eucharist, to accept, I don't know that anybody ever fully understands it. I mean, I've, I've worked with RCIA for a whole bunch of years. And I had one gal one time who she wanted scientific evidence. I wish I was better versed on Eucharistic miracles. Maybe I could have pointed her to some. Uh, I, I don't know that we have it. I don't know that we have scientific evidence. But what our senses fail to fathom, that's what we accept. This is the main thing first. Do you, do you accept Jesus? 
And then after that, you desire to be connected. And he set it up this way. He, I don't know that he consulted any, uh, anybody on how to do it. I think if we had advised him, it wouldn't have looked like this exactly. But this is the way he designed it, that we would be intimately connected, physically connected, regularly connected. And to not accept the invitation, well, if you accept the invitation, you communicate. If you don't accept the invitation, you excommunicate. You take yourself out of the communion. Um, the church is pretty adamant about uh, you shouldn't participate in communion unless you really buy into the whole thing. That's, uh, it's, it's an act of faith every time. And I don't know that it necessarily is for a lot of us. Because it's, it's no secret that an awful lot of our people don't make a weekly connection. Don't, aren't, maybe that Muslim really knew what he was talking about. He says, no, they, they don't believe that. They wouldn't miss. If they really believe that, they'd be there. Does communion affect our lives? It's really something we have to look at. Now, we're going to sh share, like it or not, Whatever is real for us is what's going to be shared with your child. And your child, developmentally, they're second graders. They're very logical. They're very practical. Um, they watch me, watch me. They want to demonstrate competence. They, they want to be able to participate in anything. Things are simple. They're black, they're white. They're concrete. Uh, they're, not, they're not abstract, anything like that. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. There's a lot of discussion in our church about um, right age for things. And when Pope Pius put it down here at second grade, it used to be way long time ago, up at 12, 12 years old. And he moved it back, saying that they had reached the age of reason. Do you agree? Is your child reasonable? And hopefully so. We have to be, in some ways, pretty literal about this because that's what we profess, that this really is Jesus present. Body, soul, and divinity. He, it's a contact point. Um, so we want to take advantage of where they are and make those same connections. This is a celebration of real presence. Our church talks about how Jesus is really present four ways. Every time we get together for Mass, Christ is truly present. He's present in the assembly. I don't know if this is exactly true, but when uh, Greg Schmidt was our pastor, Father Schmidt, he said one day after a real big snow, he goes, nobody showed up. I just locked the door. He says, I, didn't, I couldn't celebrate Mass because there was nobody there to bring into communion. Uh, that's an interesting idea. I don't know if that's exactly right, though. Uh, but he was just revealing that uh, Christ walks through the door. He, he walks in, in with his people. So the assembly themselves are a kind of a presence. Monsignor Norab loves to push out that as celebrant, he is persona Christi. He is acting in the person of Christ so that the celebrant is an element of presence. Every time we read from the scriptures, we say, the word of the Lord, you know, thanks be to God, all that stuff, that that is inspired language. God is present in his word. We say, and then the elements, the sacramental elements of bread and wine, that Christ is truly present uh, in the bread and wine. So celebration of Mass is a celebration of presence in more than just one way. It's a, uh, an immersion in the, in the presence of Jesus. And that's something to be appreciated right there. I like this quote from St. Augustine. He would say, 
in, when he would distribute communion, he would say, see what you are, become what you see, the body of Christ. There's, some, there's a lot of truth to that. You are what you eat, what you have integrated into the, the very being of your body. So, when we talked also about Eucharist, are we talking about a sacred event? Or a sacred action? Or a sacred thing? Well, when I just went through that, that those elements of presence, it's more than just the thing. And this seems to be a pendulum that swings in our awareness. If you ever take a look at church history, how it goes a little bit back and forth, back and forth. How Eucharist can be a, an ex, a big action, and some people will take a look at Eucharist as just the elements themselves. So hopefully we can build an appreciation for both and explore the dimensions that are being played out in the action as well as the elements themselves that we're taking a look at. Now, what are some of those active elements? I think we're, we're pretty safe on the, uh, uh, the element idea, the thing, but maybe not so good on the others. On our activity day with the, uh, the kids, we do, we do kind of like, what are all these things that are going on in the mass? It's about belonging to God's family. Well, take a look at them. They all, not all, most of them end with ING. Most of them are actions, things that are, should be happening. Uh, I heard a guy talking about Mass one time, and he said, you know, if we were really doing all these things, we'd be exhausted at the end of Mass. We would, there would be so much spiritual energy being exercised by us that we'd have to take a rest. Celebrating, reconciling, listening, remembering, caring, giving thanks, sharing. All of these things are supposed to be happening at the same time or during that time. Um, part of my education, I went to school at uh, Loyola in New Orleans. And I liked uh, going to mass at the university. They used to do something. It was it's a Jesuit university. And at Sunday mass, they, they had what they called a conversational homily. Anybody ever experienced one of those? Where if the mass was normal in that, you know, they do the readings and the uh, celebrant would give his reflection, and maybe it worked because it was at a university. They say, okay, talk about it. And you'd circle up, everybody would, you know, circle up, and they'd talk about what he had said, what they had heard, all that kind of stuff. And it, it added 15 or 20 minutes to the to the celebration, but it, it kind of helped me appreciate what was going on there where, have you ever heard where they said, uh, your worship, you should better live, you should live so that you could better worship, and then worship so that you can better live. That there was this dynamic collaboration, there was this ongoing cycle where uh, what you were experiencing in liturgy was having direct effect on your living and your living was having direct effect on your worship. And the uh, putting a spotlight on that with that conversational homily really made you listen, really, really made you think, uh, appropriate what it was that was being said. And I don't know, do we put that kind of energy into our experience of liturgy? Or do we just kind of endure it? Like it all just happens out there and I'm, I got private thoughts on it. I don't know about you. I know when I was younger, like really young, the people who went to mass, they were saying rosaries, they were reading their holy books, and the priest was up there saying something in Latin, and they were, and it was like there was this divorce between, this disconnect, maybe that's a better word. There was this disconnect between what was going on. And then after Vatican II, it was like, no, 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 no. It's supposed to be the source and summit of what we do, and it's supposed to be very active with you know, engaging, uh, putting it in the languages that you use, that you, you're the, the vulgar language, the common language. Uh, and I, I don't know that we've realized part of the vision of that council for what that worship actually means, what it could be. That's a bonus one. Over time, Eucharist has been called lots of different things. 
It's been called the sacred meal, putting an accent on the communion. It's been called the holy sacrifice of the mass, putting an emphasis on what Jesus did. It's been called anamnesis, which is like, do you remember an old commercial where Red Baron pizza, a guy, they would eat this pizza and the Red Baron would gradually be there in there? That's kind of anamnesis. It was, you know, calling into reality. Communion, putting the emphasis on what you carry out of there. Eucharist, an act of thanksgiving, what the word actually means. Liturgy, which is a Greek term that means work. It is the function, the role, the occupation of the church. It's their duty to gather the faithful and celebrate with them. And another one, it's the mass, which is taken from the last words, the dismissal uh, in Latin. We say ask, you know, you're, you're sent. You're gathered to be sent. Sacred mystery. Nobody truly understands what all is going on there. And somehow, if you put them all together, you get a better image of what it's all about, what's going on. Many times I've, I've heard people say, I don't get anything out of Mass. I said, wow, your hose is flowing the wrong direction. Because uh, I used to love the way Monsignor Leach would start every, every prayer service. He always started, we have come to give God our love and worship. We come to give our love and worship, not to get. We will get. You will come back. You will be enriched. You will be changed. But the more you give, the more you get. And if you're not giving, if you're just enduring, you're missing a lot of opportunity there. OK, that's kind of a, a background a little bit on the, the catechesis, the, um, the thinking about w what it is we're trying to share with our kids and appreciation of real presence. Uh, that active engagement with the opportunities that are there and how it changes the way you live. So that's what we're about. Now, what are we going to do? What are our practical concerns? One thing is, on the first Sunday of Lent, the tradition is to kind of parade your initiates in front of your congregation. So. Uh, the confirmation candidates, they write their candidacy letters. Uh, the first communicants come up and they're presented before the congregation. If we have an RCIA candidate, I think we got one. Um, they're presented to the congregation. Now, the way that works is it's whatever mass you go to, we do it at all the masses. So it doesn't matter if you go Saturday night or any mass on Sunday. Uh, the kids are called forward and uh, there's a blessing for all of them and prayers from the congregation. And then when they return to their seats, there's a lapel pin that they pick up that designates them as initiates. Now what we ask is that they wear that pin every weekend. Every, every time they come to mass, wear the pin and it identifies them as somebody who's in preparation, somebody who's in the uh, process. And you know what it does? It, uh, it, it offers other folks an opportunity. Ah, it's a special year for you. How great. This is the, you know, I hope you're having fun, all that kind of stuff. And if they don't have it on, they, they don't recognize them as such. Also, we like to give our um, candidates an opportunity to uh, present themselves to the parish. And the way they do it, there's this little sheet in your packet. And it just, it's got a live, big blank area right there and a couple little things to write below it. We ask that you paste a picture of your child. Now every year there's two or three that come back where somebody draws a picture. That's not what it's for. Um, we ask that you pay, you know, take a picture of the kid and print it out and put it on there and they, they answer a couple questions. That book is put on display in the foyer of church and it's um, just an opportunity for anybody who's interested to flip through the book, see who our initiates are this year. I can tell you that I have several times found this book in the Adoration Chapel. Somebody will take that book in with them. Um, same for the Confirmation. We have a similar book for the Confirmation kids. They'll take that in and uh, they'll see who the kids are and they'll pray for the kids and I just think that's a, a really good thing. That's a cool thing. So that has to be in before the Mass. So we're asking for them on February 12th so we can put the book together for the weekend. 
Hopefully that makes sense. That's pretty simple. The church is a fanatic record keeper. Uh, the form that is in your packet has to be filled out. Please be accurate. Um, that, uh, just that piece of paper I hand to the parish secretary. And she enters it into the permanent record. Um, so it has to be done. You'll notice it, oh, it's not on this one. It's not on the one on the screen. But the one in your uh, binder, at the bottom it asks for the number of guests. I had to go through the church. I'd like this for an architectural principle. They figure a person for every 18 inches. I know a lot of persons that are more than 18 inches. But using that figure, our church, we could hold 81 candidates if they each had 10 guests. We have 75, I believe, this year. So we're bumping up there. We do have a few on the same pews, not many. We need to know how many guests you have. If you're way over 10, that ain't good. Uh, it, it could be awkward. So, um, and it, actually, you know how our church is designed. If you know you're only going to have four, you got the front pew. You know, that's the way it's going to go. So we, we do need to know, and you need to plan, try to limit to 10. Uh, if you're in an extreme circumstance, then we, we can bump it for a few people, but boy, hopefully not everybody. Hate to do that, but trying to keep it comfortable for the, everyone who comes. Activity day has become a big part of our program. On that day, they will, uh, they bake bread, they make chrismons, they, uh, how many times have they been through this? What else do they do? They watch a movie, they, what else do they do? Oh, yeah, there's a special prayer experience. We call it the hard room. Uh, oh, got to make the plates. I didn't bring one of those down. There's no one up there. Um, we, we, we've been doing this since 1986, so there are lots of... How many of you have a plate in your house? You know what I'm talking about. They're, they're, they're plastic plates. They're melamine plates. Every one of them, every year, the, the design is different. Uh, they color the, a tissue thing. And we send them to some place in Dallas, and they turn them into a plate. They do that, too. Now, um, for the, the school, it's during a school day, Thursday, March 7th. And for PSR, it's the next following Saturday, March 9th, in the cafeteria. Uh, school, we, we need to know if you want to be part of the day. Don't require it. But it does take some help to be part of that. And for the PSR, I kind of need a... Uh, a parent to come along. Oh, another thing they do, they do a Last Supper at Akron with the towel thing. They always do that, too. So those two days are kind of special on the calendar. Um, put them there. <laughs> Dress is always a major concern. Um, basically, for girls, if you wear it, it's white. The white is the symbolic color of an initiation sacrament. So you would wear white for baptism, white for communion. Um, boys, we achieve the same, we tap into the same symbolism with a long sleeve white shirt. No jacket during the ceremony. We used to allow it, it became a real, um, I don't know what to call it, inconvenience. It was distraction. It was a real distraction. It's just better just don't wear it. During, if you want to put one on for a picture or something, that's okay. But uh, girls, a, a veil is not required for the girls, but a lot of them wear them. That's fine. We do say no gloves during the service because I hope for obvious reasons. Um, boys would wear a tie but we don't get picky about what color or anything, just darks. A long sleeve white shirt, dark tie, dark slacks, we're fine. Um, if you get the long sleeve white shirt right now, it's not too hard to find. If you wait to get it in April, it's kind of tough. Uh, it'll be a little harder to find. Doesn't matter. 
you won't go crazy. Just kind of dressed up, so it fits the bill. Did I ask, does anybody have any questions? Sometimes there's questions on clothes. When you're, everybody, they wanted their boys to wear pastel colors. I said, well, no, we're going we're gonna to stick with the symbolism. Okay, uh, there is one fee for both First Reconciliation and First Communion for, you know, costs a little bit for the plate and the materials and the, all the stuff we do. So there's a fee of $30 uh, for both of them. And um, ask to have that in by the end of February. I don't know if I uh, didn't have a date up there. A couple of options. Um, I don't know how this came to be a thing, but it is. It's, it's quite a thing to make banners for a First Communion. It's kind of a family activity. Please hear this. It's not a requirement. If your family enjoys just kind of getting around the table and putting together a banner and the kid's name on it or something like that, that's great. We'll display it. We have a, a way. If it's cause for shouting and screaming and all that kind of stuff, just forget it. It's not that big a deal. Um, nobody's going to take inventory. Everybody's going to look at whatever's there. You'll, you'll see them, but uh, it's not a requirement. If it enhances your experience, go for it. There is one sheet inside there, the packet, that gives instructions for making a banner. And most of those are for display purposes. In order to display them, they have to be, they have to fit the system. Uh, some, I mean, there's a few people who've kind of made a business out of making banners, and that's fine, we'll put those up. They have one banner for the family, and they just add so-and-so's name each time as they come down. Um, so, so I remember I've seen a couple where grandma quilts a banner. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I've seen some where, well, personally, I think the neatest one I ever saw was a, a bas-relief sculpture on wood where a grandpa carved a Last Supper scene and put his grandson in the scene. I just went, that's really cool. <laughs> you know, that's really great. You know, but it can stand right next to one made out of burlap and felt, and that's fine. It, it, there's no, no kind of judgment put on top of it. One's as meaningful as the next. They're fine. And another thing, again, option. Um, this request was made, and we go, well, if you like to do that, that's fine. That, we'll, we'll provide for it, where you would write a keepsake letter uh, to your child. It might even be for them later. If you choose to, we will send home an envelope, and we'll have a label with your child's name on it. You are invited, if you want, to write a letter to them about how significant and special this occasion is. If you write it, you will bring it with you to the ceremony. There'll be a basket that you put it in. They'll be presented at the offertory. The priest will say something about them, give them a blessing. At the end of Mass, a server carries them out and puts them with all the other stuff that, that you'll be taking home that day. So nobody up here reads anything. It's just between you and the child, and it's got a little place in the ceremony. We'll send out a reminder about it. Uh, and it's, again, it's an option. If you want to do it, Nobody knows but you if you did it. So. No, um, I'm not going to take that on. <laughs> if you if you if you want to do it, if, if somebody else wants to do it, and, and we'll we'll extend the invitation. But um, um, I do know that rosaries are quite often a common gift at first communion. You know that that happens a whole lot. Yeah, it's kind of fun to play with the beads, but um, I can tell you too that 
the Knights of Columbus give our kids rosaries in fourth grade because uh, it's part of our fourth grade curriculum for a unit on rosa rosaries mysteries. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I don't think I'm going to layer another. If you do it, well, we'll extend the invitation, but again, it would just be an option if you didn't want to do it. Okay, in your, uh, also in your packet, there's one sheet for parent assistance. If there's uh, the dates that are reminders, um, basically kind of a synopsis of what I said. Uh, two things I just want to pitch out there right now. We used to take pictures before First Communion. And we would set it up so that he, he would set up in the uh, school lobby. And uh, for the past couple of times that he did it, he goes, this is, isn't working. You know, there's not as much interest. So at that time, I surveyed, and we kind of let it go. Because um, people who really wanted pictures were making their own arrangements and visiting studios and things like that. And so we, we let go of pictures. We will take a group picture at the end. That, that will happen, but individual pictures won't be part of it. Um, another thing, was it last year or two years? I don't remember where it was. Uh, when we stopped taking pictures, our service has always had, had, had always the policy on the service on the Saturday of the weekend before Mother's Day. That's just always First Communion here. And uh, 11 o'clock. Well, we had it at 11 o'clock because of the pictures. Well, when we dropped the pictures, I go, well, would it be more convenient? I shouldn't say that. I was asked, can we change it to, to 10? Because that's more convenient for the gatherings that follow. And I was like, oh, well, maybe. OK. Now, I sampled several people. And they were like, eh, leave it at 11. Leave it at 11. So if you think 10 is better, I'm leaving it at 11 this year. If you think you, you, got, you would have to tell me and uh, we could consider it for next time. But for, right, for this year, it's at 11 o'clock. Uh, the service itself is a long hour. So if it starts at 11, it's like done at 12.05 or something. And then we set up for the, a group picture. Um, and usually, folks want to take a few pictures and things, which is fine. And Usually, you're actually home at 12.30. That's pretty common. OK? I did provide a checklist. If you're going, when I'm begging, one thing I beg of you is don't throw this packet away all at one time. <laughs> throw away one sheet at a time. I don't need that one. I don't need that one. You know, or, or just let the folder sit there. But part of it is like, are we on track? Have we done the things we're supposed to do? Is this going well? And that's what the checklist is for. So if you, you can go down the list, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we didn't do that. You know, that hopefully gets us all on the same page. And because this is the one and only time that we all get together, do you have any questions? What do you want to bet? that as soon as I say we're done, somebody comes up with a question. Ah, thank you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because you would, technically, you've got 20, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, you'll just get a big pew at the back. Which is, in our church, it's kind of nice that, uh, there are some of those options that, you know. Another question? Well, we did good. I told you it'd be about an hour. It was 40 minutes. That ain't bad. There's no football game. But we did it. We're done. <laughs>